Um, as we're uh, as we're going through Galatians here, I've been using a number of resources to uh, to kind of listen to the the wider church in terms of how we read Scripture and how we uh, and how we engage Scripture together. So I've been using some great resources from Craig Keener, from N. T. Wright, and uh, and even a few things that my dad had written in the past. So I just like to kind of incorporate that into what we're doing is that we're actually listening together as we walk through the Scripture. And I think that's really important. So. Anyways, uh, like we've done the last couple of weeks, I'd just like to start in prayer um, that God would speak to us as we look through these words of Scripture, especially the ones that are familiar and sometimes the things that, that aren't familiar. So, Lord, we, we come before you again as we look through your word, and, and God, we ask that you would speak to us and that you would help us to hear things that we need to hear, especially as we go through some passages that may be quite familiar to us. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you'd quicken it in our hearts and, and that you would make these words come alive again in new and fresh ways and, and that you would bring them to life in our hearts where they need to come to life. And Lord, uh, where some things that we are going to hear might be new and unfamiliar, Lord, I hope that you would help us with those things as well too, just to... Give us revelation and insight so that we can hear what you, are, uh, what you are speaking to us through the scriptures. And we pray that in your name. Amen. All right. Well, this morning we're going to uh, continue right along with our message series through the New Testament letter of Galatians. And, uh, and like, we've been, uh, like we've been doing for the past couple of weeks... Uh, we're going to focus in on the theme of freedom that runs through this uh, letter. It's, it's, it's one of the many themes. There's a lot of rich content in this letter. And we could, you know, we could spend months teaching through this if we were going to go really, really, uh, you know, as deep as we could. But, uh, but for our sake, we're going to uh, just focus on a few things because, you know what, we can always come back to it later as, uh, as God leads us. So, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to focus on this, uh, on this theme of freedom because part of the good news of Jesus that's proclaimed by this letter is that Jesus has appeared, he dwelt among us, and he gave himself for us to set us free. And Jesus sets us free from our slavery to ourselves and all the things inside of us uh, that, uh, that hold us in bondage, our slavery to others, and ultimately our slavery to sin and to death. So in light of this freedom that we have in Jesus, some big questions that we have and that the letter addresses are how do we receive this freedom and what does true freedom really look like rather than engaging some sort of alternate slavery and how do we remain free? Because we recognize that there are threats to our freedom and forces at work to draw us back into slavery. So what we've been seeing as we've been journeying through Galatians is that the gospel the gospel of Jesus shows us the way into freedom and keeps us walking in freedom right into eternal life. Now, as we take a look at the second half of Galatians chapter 2, just want to uh, very, very briefly uh, catch up on some content so that we understand where we're going today. So pardon some of the repetitiveness here, but I just want to make sure that we can, uh, that we can jump back into uh, to the, a very weighty section um, with both feet on the ground here. So as the church is being born and expands through Jerusalem with its Jewish roots, we have an increasing number of new believers who were Gentiles. And the big question that's facing the early church is should these Gentile Christians who were born out of this Jewish church, should they convert to Judaism in the process of becoming Christians? So, you know, what does the freedom won by Jesus the Messiah mean for God's plans of redemption and how that works? And because we see the story of salvation uh, and the story of salvation history had, had been and is worked through God's covenants with his people. So for many centuries, these covenants were mediated through the law of Moses. But now what do we do in light of this new covenant with Jesus? The big question really is, how does one become a covenant member of God's family in light of the gospel of Jesus? Because becoming a part of God's family is the big issue here. Because it's through that relationship that God saves us and sets us free. <clears throat> 
And we see that the answer is found right in the gospel itself. And it's, it's the issue with this ancient question, and it's an issue with many of our modern questions today about how we become a part of God's family. So let's dig right in here where we left off and uh, dive into Galatians 2, starting at verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, little note here, Cephas is uh, the Aramaic name for Peter, comes from the word kepha, which means rock. So that's the, the name that Jesus gave to Peter. Peter, he called him rock. And uh, Paul is now using Peter's name, his nickname, rock, here in a little bit of a, uh, an ironic way. <laughs> when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of all of them, You're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Now this incident here, uh, that's, that's recalled here, comes after the events that we read about in uh, last week at the beginning of Galatians 2 and also paralleled in Acts chapter 15. So Paul and his co-workers in the gospel, they, they go to Jerusalem to disclose the gospel that they've been preaching to the Gentiles. And the Jerusalem apostles agree that the gospel Paul preaches is the authentic gospel of Jesus. So they give him the right hand of fellowship, demonstrating that there is unity in the church and its teaching. And then they happily agree that Paul and his co-workers should continue on mission to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. Now in Acts 15, we also saw James as the leader of the Jerusalem church. He issues a letter clearing up this issue, laying it all out. So the matter should be settled and done and everybody moving forward, right? Or not. <laughs> At a later time here in Antioch, we find that things go way backwards. Now, while our, our culture has some very different values with who we eat with, table fellowship in the first century was a very different matter, a very serious matter. I mean, we go to, you know, any random restaurant out there and we're just, you know, we're sitting with whoever and we don't care, you know. We go to McDonald's or whatever and we sit by a table. We don't know who's beside us, you know, like that guy there could be a mass murderer over there and <laughs> over here this person could be the, the most wonderful saint who is, uh, you know, fed 10,000 people or something. We don't know, you know, who we're eating with and so forth and we just generally don't have that value. So, so some of the story might not even quite, we might not even feel the full gravity of this, but for the first century people, table fellowship was very, very serious. People, and especially not faithful Jews, they would not eat with just anybody. Table fellowship and sharing meals together was, in a sense, a covenantal act of relationship. It was a powerful action that demonstrated belonging to one another. It was a very significant act of engaging one another. So just like circumcision was a symbol for the Jews, which spoke of their family and, and ethnic identity, table fellowship was also the, a very symbolic act of family identity. You eat with people who you consider your people, who you consider your homies, your family. You know? So the gospel, the gospel says that because of what Jesus has done. God has created one new single family where we all belong together. That's the plan of God, drawing all people into himself. And Peter knew this fact of the gospel and he affirmed it. And he practiced what he preached. And he even walked in that freedom. So when we get here, what changed? What changed? It's just like when Peter had seen the Lord and he was able to walk on the water, but then all of a sudden he 
looked around and saw the wind and the waves you know, down at his feet, and something happened that caused him all of a sudden to sink. Just like that, something happened. Well, the text says that certain people came from James. They were not sent necessarily, but came from James people, so some of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And Peter knew that these folks would not approve of this freedom in the gospel, of having table fellowship with Gentiles, of calling them our own making them our family. Now, scholars also tell us that uh, Jerusalem at this time was becoming increasingly conservative because of all the things that, were, uh, that they were dealing with and so forth. So the tension around this issue was, was, gaining, uh, was gaining some momentum. Now, as the apostle entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, to the Jews, Peter attempts to maintain the appearance of of Jewish respectability in this situation. And he attempts to avoid offending those Jews to whom were his mission. Because Peter's reputation in Jerusalem was at stake here. And if he makes the wrong move, he could be in trouble. Now the text is clear with the real issue here. It's fear. Peter was afraid of the people he was supposed to reach, And he was afraid of the people that he was supposed to lead. He was afraid of the repercussions if he didn't fall in line with their expectations. And so what does he do? He decides that it would be easier to conform to the expectations of the challengers than to persuade them of their new freedom in Christ. So acting on fear, he becomes a slave to this fear and a slave to these expectations of one another. And he loses his freedom in Christ. And he loses his fellowship. And where we came together, all of a sudden divisions come back. Now, can you think of any issues right now in your life where you feel fear to conform or else? Is this situation relevant to your life in any way? I can think of a number of ways in my life where I feel the pressure from different places to conform or else. And, and I'm talking, not talking here about, you know, simple thing, you know, like what way do you put the toilet paper this way? You know, like <laughs> issues where, where obedience to God is, and we all know that you're supposed to put it this way, not that way. Um, but, <laughs> but I'm talking about issues where obedience to God is on the line. Do you ever feel that pressure to conform? Well, what might be at stake for you if you do? Because there's some high stakes here that we're seeing in our story. Or to put it another way, what might be at stake for your witness to the gospel if you do give in? Will people be able to see that it's true, that it's worth it? So Paul, he confronts Peter to his face, and before everyone present, he, uh, he lays out the issue here. Not because this is just some sort of trivial argument or some sort of social faux pas, but he confronts the hypocrisy of the situation, where Peter is acting, he's pretending to be something that he's not. You know, he's confronting this inconsistency of, of who he was and what he had been doing, with this pretending for the sake of, of appeasing these, uh, these challengers that came from Jerusalem. And Paul does confront this because the issues at stake are serious. The heart of the gospel is at stake. What God has brought together, we should not again divide and separate. Where God has brought freedom, we should not again submit to a yoke of slavery. A serious issue here. Now, this is a real tricky issue here. Paul deals with it at some length in Romans 14 and 15. But the the thing is here, how do you avoid offending the kind of believers? In, In Romans, Paul says the weaker believers who are easily offended without at the same time giving up your freedom in Christ. That's kind of the issue here. In Romans, we see that Paul cared about people on both sides of the fence here. 
But the bottom line is this. We don't use our freedom on one hand to cause others to stumble and lose their faith. So we're careful on how we behave. But on the other hand, if they insist that we do it their way, then we resist even to the forfeit of our life. Why? Because the essence of the gospel is at stake. We don't let people rob us of the truth. And we don't let people rob us of our freedom in Christ. Be compassionate by all means. Love those who are performance oriented. Love those who are Pharisees, who are hypocrites, legalistic, people who are self-righteous because there's a little bit of that in all of us, isn't there? <laughs> Love them and show them grace. But never, ever bow, never capitulate, and never give in. Why not? Well, look what happened here in our story. When Barnabas observed Peter, what happened? It undermined his faith. And he was no longer sure of his own freedom in Christ. Text says that he was led astray by their hypocrisy. There are effects here larger than ourselves. How quickly, how easily the whole church gets its eyes off of Jesus. How quickly and how easily can we be captured by the fear, by the doubt, and by the confusion, and by the unbelief? There's a lot at stake here. And particularly the important things. Like the message of the gospel and our freedom in Jesus. Okay, let's move on and uh, start up at... Uh, Verse 15, Paul then continues, We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I would really be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now, this little section of Scripture is absolutely power-packed and rich with so many things. And uh, we can't go through all of the details that are here. But what I do want to point out here is that, you know, Paul is moving from the story behind the letter right into some deep theology of the letter where he, where he starts to get in uh, really into the core issues here, past the surface arguments and right to the core of things here. One thing I want to highlight here with what we're reading is that the basic foundational issue here is about identity. Who are the true covenant people of God? Who is the true Israel to whom the covenant promises and blessings belong? Is it all who belong to the Messiah or is it only the Jewish Christians with Gentiles remaining on the fringe here? So Paul breaks it down to the basics. And he reminds all listeners something that they, uh, that they would know. Is that God's true Israel really consists of one person. And that is Jesus the Messiah. He is the one faithful Israelite. He is the true Israelite. He is the only one who has kept the covenant and kept it perfectly. He's the one. So, to be the people of God, to be true Israel, you must belong to him. So now the question becomes, well then, who belongs to the Messiah? 
You know, how is that identity expressed? And Paul's answer is one that's a, a little bit difficult for some of our modern Western thinking, but he's often expressing it in his writing, and that is this, that those who belong to the Messiah, he says, are in the Messiah. So we often read this phrase as we go through the epistles of being in Christ. Those who belong to the Messiah are in the Messiah. So that what is true of him is true of us. Now this answer of Paul's deeply rooted in Jewish thought and their beliefs about the king. The king represents his people. And that's kind of similar for us today. Whether we like it or not, Justin Trudeau represents Canada. So when he goes abroad to say uh, China or something like that, to say something, he speaks on behalf of all Canadians. And as far as the Chinese are concerned, what he says is what we all say because he represents us. And it's the same, this, so the same kind of thing. What is true of him and what he says to our foreign partners is what is true of us because he represents us. And it is the same thing of how we as the Messiah's people are comprehended in him as our representative. What is true of him is then true of us. And we see this thinking uh, running through the New Testament and elaborated more uh, through the New Testament. Now the point Paul is making with all of this is that the true people of God are all who are in the Messiah. And this means both Gentiles and Jews. If you're in the Messiah, you are the people of God. No other requirements. Now, the implications of this new identity in the Messiah are in Christ are quite profound. To best understand what Paul's saying in this very dense and complex passage, we need to skip right to, skip right to the punchline, the summation of his argument. Or in verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If our new identity is in Christ, and he was crucified, then in Christ, what happens? We too are crucified. What is true of him becomes true of us. Whatever we previously were has now died on the cross in him. In him, what happens then? We are given new life. We are given his life. It is now his life that lives in us. And we are given a new identity in him. This is the new creation that God has made through what Jesus has done. We're given a new identity in him and a new foundation by which to live. Now, for the Jews, Paul says, to, to help them along, he says, we Jews were born into the covenant family, yet now we no longer find our identity as God's people through the things which separated us as distinct people like the Jewish law. That's no longer our marker of identity because we've been crucified in Christ. The old is dead and something new has come alive. It is Christ living in me. So that no longer defines them. The law no longer defines them. They're now defined by the Messiah and life in him. So everyone, Jew or Gentile, comes to the cross where the old dies and then the new comes to life because we are all now the Messiah's people and it is his life that is now at work in us. It's kind of a poor illustration because it's all I could think of. <laughs> I, I recall my experience as a young boy in Canada who was born in America and came to Canada as a young boy. I recall retaining the identity of the land of my birth. Even as a little guy, just... Living in Edmonton, I just like, oh, no, wait, I'm, I'm American, you know, to all of my Canadian friends and all my schoolmates. Yes, good for you Canadians, but I am American. And I carried some of my American culturalisms with it. And, you know, a few things that I learned from my parents as they were, 
you know, very American and new to Canada, and then my grandparents and all my relatives, all the Americanisms that I could learn. I was American, yeah, America, you know. So I retained this identity, but there was a process and a decision that eventually came when I realized that, uh, you know what, I'm Canadian and I want to embrace Canada as my home and my identity. So there's a process and a decision to release my old identity as American and to actually take on my new identity as a Canadian. And I even did that before I officially gained my citizenship in 1996. But I recall doing that. I was just like, you know what? I'm not that anymore. I am this. There was something that happened where my identity then had to be reformed. And it actually changed some of the ways I thought and behaved about a few things. Our identity is a very, very powerful thing. Now, I know that others of you have had much more profound experiences than this. You know, U.S. and Canada, there's a little bit of difference. Some of you have come from the complete other side of the planet, and I'm sure it, uh, it's even uh, a more stark reality for you of what it was like to, to leave a place that was home and then to find a new home and a new identity here. It is the same kind of thing when we come into Christ, is that whatever we once were, that identity we let go it died on the cross, and we let it stay dead in the grave, and we take up that new identity in Jesus, and we live from that and in that. So for all of us, whether, uh, whether first century Jews and Gentiles or 21st century Canadians, embracing our identity in Christ will require some relearning of who we are. And embracing our identity in Christ will mean letting go of some things. Letting go of some things that had previously defined us and controlled us and possibly in some ways even enslaved us. Now all of us have a number of different identities through which we live. And here's just kind of a, a sample list off the top of my head. We all have some ethnic identities, yeah? I can look around and think of, uh, you know, some different ethnic identities from what I know of you. For myself, you know, I'm, I'm a Slovak, German, and Finnish. I have that kind of ethnic identity in me, and I, it uh, speaks into who I am and how I behave. I have an identity as a member of the Rozu family, and that also speaks something into to, to who I am and so forth. I have identity with regards to my faith in Jesus. Um, in, in even a more generalized way. I have identity now as a Canadian, my national identity. I have some identity, and uh, a little less so in terms of uh, my political leanings, but I know for many people, their political leanings are a very big part of their identity. I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal, I'm progressive, I'm this, I'm that, and so forth, and it forms a big part of who they are. And for many of us, our occupations or our vocations even form part of our, our identity. Um, how we will often refer to ourselves even in terms of just what we do for a living. And then historically, so there's some things that can even form uh, what our identity is. You know, things that we've done. Accomplishments that we've had. Or possibly even things that have been done to us that can, you know, like woundings that can sometimes even start to define our identity. Now, uh, the, the point that I want to make with all of this is that we're not to reject the uniqueness that God created in us. You know, for example, because I find my identity in Jesus, um, I don't reject that the fact that I'm Slovak, German, and Finnish. <laughs> so, you know, I can enjoy Slivovitz and Schnitzel and Asana. And uh, <laughs> praise the Lord Jesus, you know? <laughs> You know, the, God created uh, God created us unique and he created us different uh, to express beauty and to express his glory into creation. So, uh, so there are things that God has created that we say yes and amen and we bless it. But being in Christ and having our identity in Christ means that everything else is now in submission to Christ who lives in me. The Slovak, German, and Finnish 
person in me is in submission to Jesus. And it is my identity in Jesus from which my life flows. And just the beauty of those other things um, adds to the beauty of God's creation. But for Christ to live in me means that everything is in submission to him, first and foremost. So for Christ to live in me means a freedom from having to satisfy all these other identities. And there's such a powerful draw with some of these things. We can see that in our world today. I'm just going to harp on it again because uh, I read too much news. <laughs> like our political identities and how some of our political leanings and other groups of people that we identify, how much that controls and draws our behavior, our feelings, our thoughts, and so forth. And very often in ways that are opposed to Jesus. There's also a number of... Uh, a number of things going on now in our world too where our ethnic identities very much can do the very same things and can draw us into behaviors that are opposed to Jesus. So to, to find our identity in Christ, for Christ to live in me means that we have a freedom from satisfying these other things in any way that is opposed to Jesus. All right. Well, if being true covenant people of God means belonging to Christ, the Messiah, we're left with the question, okay, how do we enter into right relationship with Jesus, with the Messiah? And what we read, what we just begin to read here at the end of chapter 2, and it'll really open up in chapter 3, is this. Is that Jesus, the Messiah... He is the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham way at the beginning of the Bible, right in Genesis chapter 12, and several different promises that he lays out, I think three times there in Genesis. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that God would create a single worldwide family for the healing and for the rescue of the world. The salvation story that begins right at the very beginning of Scripture Jesus is the fulfillment to that promise to Abraham. Now, how did Abraham receive that promise? He received it through faith. He received it through faith, and it was credited to him as righteousness or right relationship with God. From the very beginning, that's how it was done. And so... What Paul is saying here at the core of the gospel is that likewise, all of the Messiah's people, all of the children of Abraham, all of the children of promise that bear that same identity, they have the same identity marker, which is faith. That's it. No more complexities. Simple as that. We bear the same identity marker of faith. We are declared in right relationship with the Messiah, he says, by faith. And the, the word in the scripture there, the technical term for that is justified. We are justified. We are declared in right relationship. We are declared part of the covenant family of God by faith. If the loving faithfulness of the one who loved us and gave himself for us defines him and who he is, then what defines us is faith as well. And our response of faith to him and our reliance upon the faithfulness of Jesus. A number of scholars make, make a bit of a deal about the last half of verse 20 there. Is that the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Meaning that what Jesus has done in faith for us and what Jesus continues to do. The language actually, it, it, uh, it talks about ongoing action. Jesus is not inactive right now. Yes, he's ascended to the right hand of the Father, but he's not sitting there having a cold beer on the throne. Or I don't know, maybe he is, but <laughs> I can't really see up there. <laughs> if I were him, I would. But 
<laughs> hope I didn't blaspheme there. <laughs> but Jesus is not inactive right now. Jesus was faithful and continues to be faithful on our behalf. What do we read elsewhere in the scripture? That Jesus is interceding for us right now before the Father. And he's active in sending his spirit as our counselor, as our advocate, and so forth. Faithfulness of the one who loved us and gave himself for us defines him. Faith defines us. And that's good news of the gospel. Covenant membership and covenant blessings God gives to all who believe in his good news. Let's end it off here just by focusing one more time on this. My dad drilled this verse into me when he was uh, mentoring me not only as a child but also as a pastor. And actually one of my favorite theologians who, is, uh, who I was borrowing from uh, as I've been going through uh, our study here says the same thing. So if these two guys say it, then it's got to be true. <laughs> and they say, if you can only memorize one verse in the Bible, if that's all the brain cells you got, Da, 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 da. that's the one right there. Memorize this one. Because in here we find the core, the essence of the true gospel, of the full gospel. Crucified in Christ, no longer I who live, it is Christ who lives in me. And that is the best news ever. All of that old garbage is gone and dead and he lives in me. He has the power to live in holiness, to live in righteousness. The power to live in the presence of the Heavenly Father for whom we were created to have fellowship. And the good news here is that we live it by the faith of the Son of God. It's all about him and nothing about me. It's because of what he has done and what he continues to do we place our trust in him, and we place our trust and our faith in that. And the more I think about this and the more I love that, the more I rejoice in this and the freer I become. And the more human I become, the more natural and loving and lovable I become because Jesus is all of those things. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me.